Thank you very much for that uh, kind um, introduction and thank you for the warm welcome. It's lovely to be with you tonight. What I'd like to do over the course of my um, presentation, and I'll talk for about 30 to 45 minutes, is really to make an argument about the nature and construction of world-class performance. I want to talk about the processes through which excellence is ingrained. I want to talk about what coaches can do to accelerate the learning process when it comes to skill, or in the case of education, knowledge. And I want to take aim at the pervasive and seductive idea in the world today, a very deeply entrenched notion that world-class performance is fundamentally about natural talent. That you have a certain group of people uh, who are born with the right set of gifts uh, or aptitudes or in the scientific vocabulary the right kind of genetic inheritance that enables them to excel. And on the other hand you have a group of rather less fortunate people who lack those gifts or aptitudes and by implication are destined at best for mediocrity. I want to submit to you that this idea about success, which is a cornerstone of Western culture, is at best misleading and at worst highly destructive. Destructive of the young people who buy into it in a measurable way and corrosive of the institutions, whether sports clubs uh, or schools or businesses that construct their culture upon it. I want to argue that the two variables above all else that predict high levels of performance in anything complex, and I shall define complexity as I go along, each of which is important, and I want to really make observations about both of them uh, if there's time, are the quantity of practice on the one hand, or the quantity of our domain experience, and equally importantly, the quality of those experiences, the quality of our practice. This second thing, I think, is a tremendously exciting area and is particularly significant to an audience which I know is made up of a lot of uh, coaches and teachers. Um, it was very kindly mentioned in the intro that before becoming a writer, I was a, a table tennis player, British number one for 10 years. Seems a hell of a long time ago now. Um, but I sort of bought into the idea as a table tennis player that I'd got to the top because I'd been blessed. I'd been conferred with these special gifts at a young age, and this had sort of taken me to the top. And it's a particular kind of gift that I thought that I had. I don't know if anybody caught the table tennis on the telly uh, at the last Olympic Games, but it's one of the fastest sports in the world, very dynamic. And when people used to watch me play, they often used to say, you've been born with super fast reactions. How on earth else are you able to react to the ball in a blink of an eye? That's what drew you to table tennis, a sport where reaction speed seems to be significant, enabled you to improve quite fast in the early weeks and months, and ultimately propelled you to world-class levels of performance. A journalist who came to watch me play in the US Open in the early 1990s wrote in a national newspaper, Matthew Side has reaction speed at the outer limits of human capability. Which was a rather, thank you. Which was a rather nice thing to read. And I cut it out and kept the clipping. But I was disabused of this notion when I had a game of tennis. Not table tennis, tennis. With a chap called Michael Stieg. Now Stieg as some of you will know, uh, is a former Wimbledon champion, beat Boris Becker in the final. I was uh, interviewing Stieg for the Times. He was meeting me to promote the competition he was playing in later that week at the Royal Albert Hall. And my editor said, look, it might be rather fun if instead of going along as a journalist with a dictaphone, he said, look, you're a, a sports person. Why don't you take a racket along, have a game with Stieg across the net, and you can have a chat that way. It will sort of add to the colour of the feature. These are the kinds of ideas that features editors have all the time, rather annoyingly. And I said, right, oh, Tim. So I took my racket along uh, to the Harbour Club in Chelsea. And uh, Stieg and I are you know, hit, batting the ball across the net. And it's rather jocular and conversational. And I was getting the information I needed for the interview. But I was also getting rather bored. I, you know, I wanted him to play flat out. I wanted to feel the force of his game. So I said, look, uh, Michael, um, you may be unaware of this, but I'm also an internationally acclaimed sportsman. <laughs> he, um, he said, really, Matthew, I've never heard of you. 
<laughs> that was an attempt at a German accent. Um, but slightly irritating, I thought, that he'd never heard of me. And I said, look, if you go down to the other end of the court and serve as fast as you possibly can, I will be able to return the ball. Utterly convinced that with the super fast reactions that had taken me to the top of world table tennis, returning a serve in tennis is going to be pretty straightforward. After all, the gap between two players in table tennis is roughly nine feet, which is the length of a table tennis table. In tennis, the gap between two players is almost precisely the distance between me and the door at the back of this room. So even though they hit the ball as hard in tennis uh, as in table tennis, you have about six...